You know, I'm really excited about uh, this morning. I'm excited about starting this brand new series on this book. I was praying, you know, in April timeline, April, May, you know, Lord, what would you have us do in the fall? Because I like to plan ahead and to think ahead about, you know, where God has us because there's something about planning, you know what I'm saying? Like you got to plan out. So I was praying about it and the Lord really laid on my heart this book. And so we're going to be going through this book uh, all the way up until Thanksgiving timeline. And so it's going to be verse by verse, precept upon precept. I think it's going to be incredible for us. It's going to be a timely word each and every week, I believe, and this morning is no exception of that. You know what I love about this book as I read it is it's a book of action. It's a book of action. It's, It's much less about doctrine as it is being the people of God who take action, that we wouldn't just be what, hearers of the word of God, but we would be what? Come on. We'd be doers as well. That we'd be people who take action for the kingdom of God, that God has for his people, he has for each and every one of us in this room good works for us to do for his glory, not for our own, but only for who? For, for Jesus and Jesus unknown. And that's what I, I love to say here. We're not built around a person or a ministry. We're built around the presence of God because what we want is we want to see all glory and honor and all praise given to Jesus and Jesus alone. And so let's read chapter one together here. We're going to be in verses one through 11 this morning. If you're ready for God's word, say let's go. Here we go, verse one. James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the 12 tribes and the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet, very, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect. You may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Verse nine, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation in the rich and his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises in its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flowers falls, and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. I've entitled my message this morning this, Joy Through Trials. Joy Through Trials? Question mark. <laughs> How is this even possible to have joy through trials? Short answer right there. Yes, sir. Jesus, joy through trials. If you like my notes, you can test notes to the numbers on the screen and what's in front of me will be uh, sent to you this morning. Let's pray and let's ask the Lord uh, to speak to us this morning as we dive into this word today. God, I pray this morning that my words would be few. That, Lord, your words would be many. Lord, not a single word would come from my flesh, God, but only through your spirit. And so, God, I pray you would soften our hearts this morning to receive from you. Lord, your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. God, I pray this morning as we open it, God, that we would rightly divide it, God. That, Lord, you would receive the glory, the honor, and the praise. God, I also know that many people in this room right now, they're going through some trials. There's some circumstances that seem insurmountable. But Jesus, we know that you are God. We know that you are sovereign. And Lord, we know that you rule and you reign. God, I pray this morning, Jesus, that God, we would be able to see, God, how we can have joy in the middle of every single circumstance and trial. But we love you. We love you, we love you, we love you. Would you help us this morning, Jesus? We don't make room for you. We give you this room, Holy Spirit. Lord, let your word be rhema to us. Let it be alive. Let it be active. Let it speak to us. 
In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said this morning, come on, amen, amen, amen. This statement that he makes in verse 2, count it all joy when you go through trials. I don't know about you, but on the surface, it seems incredibly foolish. I mean, trials and joy don't mix. It's like water and oil. When I think of trials, I do not think of joy. When I think of joy, I don't think of trials. When I think of joy, I think of vacation. I think of good food. I think of those things. I don't think of trials. How in the world am I supposed to have joy in the middle of trials? It seems like an absolute foolish statement. You know, for me, the the biggest trial that I faced in my entire life, and many of you have heard this story, so I'm not going to expound on it too much, but I lost my mom when I was five years old. She died tragically of cancer. Can you imagine someone coming up to a five-year-old, though, and say, hey, count it all joy when you go through trials. That doesn't make sense. I was thinking last week as we sit at the dinner table with Pastor Sergey and Natasha, and they were talking about what they're experiencing in Israel, all the war happening going on. But not only that, but they have family also in Ukraine. And for then for you to say in the middle of all this war and they're pastoring a church in Tel Aviv, which had a terrorist attack this past week as well, you need to be praying for them, praying for the pastors in Israel. For you to say then, count it all joy in the middle of this war, in the middle of this storm, middle of what's happening and going on, count it all joy through this trial, it seems absolutely foolish to my flesh. When I just think about it intellectually, it makes no sense at all. But actually, the writer of this passage is identifying to the persecuted church. And so in our culture today, when we think about, you know, for for us in, in America, we're all about convenience. We're all about comfort, are we not? We've got so much comfort, we've got so much convenience that our trials look completely different than those who are in Ukraine and those who are in Israel. And I'm not uh, mitigating what you may be going through right now and the hurt that you might be experiencing. I'm not at all. I'm, all I'm saying is that this statement is counter to the culture that we live in today. But here's the truth of the matter, that trials lead to a deeper joy. Trials lead to a deeper joy. So I'm going to defend this statement this morning that trials lead to a deeper joy. And really to understand this, though, you've got to ask yourself and answer two questions, which I want to answer this morning. The first two questions are this, is who is the writer of this book and whom is he writing the book of James to? We find out the answer to these two questions In the first verse, let's read this again together. It says this, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just stop right there. So who is writing this book? It is James. James is writing this book. Now, James, something interesting about him is Jesus had two disciples who were named James. Neither of them are the writer of this book. But what's incredible is actually Jesus' half-brother, James, is the writer of this book. And I say half-brother because Jesus was God in flesh, right? Joseph was James' father. God the father was Jesus' father. And so James is a half-brother of Jesus. So you can just imagine for a moment, okay? Just, just go with me here. Can you imagine having a sibling as God incarnate? Like, God in the flesh. I I, I just think for a moment like how frustrating that would actually be. I'm just going through through, through the thought process of like, man, my sibling is absolutely perfect. I can't blame them for anything. And then my parents know that it was me and not them. Like, oh my goodness, like uh, my sibling is absolutely perfect. And the only thing that in their eyes that we see in scripture that Jesus ever done wrong in their eyes is that he got lost at one point because he's in the temple and what's he doing? He's studying the word of God. And so he's like, don't you know that I'm about my father's business? I mean, the only time that he's in trouble with his parents that we see is when he's in the temple about 
the business of his father, God. (laughs) And so James is sitting here and thinking, man, I've got the perfect sibling who does no wrong. And also, he's claiming to be God. My sibling is absolutely crazy is what I would think. There's no way he's claiming to be the Messiah. So you're going to go one of two ways if you're James. Either you're going to reject this truth of him being God and the Messiah, or you're going to fully buy into it. In James, in the first part of his life, he completely rejects this idea that Jesus, his brother, is God. You can see a story of how James and some other family members, they go and they try to grab Jesus and bring him back home. Uh, but there's this shift that begins to happen in James's life, and the shift, shift happens after the resurrection of Jesus. And so if you want to, Jesus kind of lays out a plan if you want to convince your family members that you are God, okay? So Jesus lays out a plan for this in Scripture. He, what does he do? First, first step to convincing your family members that you are God, if you're trying to do that, is you've got to die a brutal death in front of thousands of people. That's your first step, okay? And then you've got to uh, be risen from the dead. And I'm not just talking about for 20 minutes. I'm talking about for three days, you've got to lay in the, in the grave, right? And then after that, you've got to be resurrected, come back to life, and walk the earth for 40 days, and then ascend into heaven. Like Jesus lays out the plan if you want to convince your siblings of this. Impossible for any of us, right? It's only possible through Jesus, the Son of God. Incredible when you think about this. So there's this shift that begins to take place in James's heart. And he has his interaction with his resurrected brother, Jesus, the Lord. And one of the greatest apologetic arguments is that James becomes this devoted follower. Where not only is he devoted, but he's willing to be stoned, be put to death for his belief that his brother is Jesus. This book was written between A.D. 48, A.D. 62, the time that A.D. 62 was when James was stoned. It's incredible to think that his brother writes, I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. His brother. Let that sink in. So who is writing this book? James, Jesus' brother. Who is he writing it to? We see in the next part of verse 1 here. It says this, the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. In other words, the 12 tribes that have been dispersed, why were they dispersed? Why did they have to flee their homeland? Because they were being persecuted against. So James, the leader of this Jerusalem church, is now writing to those who had to leave the homeland, who were dispersed, who were being severely persecuted against. That's who he's writing this book to. People who are being persecuted and dying for their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this group that he's writing to, they know a little bit about trials, do they not? They knew a little bit about circumstances that are difficult and hard. And so James, he starts off and he writes to this persecuted church. He writes, count it all joy. My brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. In this Christian life, we will encounter trials, will we not? It's not if, but it's when. And some of you right now, man, you're going through a trial. You're going through a circumstance. You're going through a situation. And if everything seems like it's good in life and you're like, man, Adam, um, everything seems really, really great, no doubt that on the horizon, sadly, there's going to be a trial that you will face. The question is not if, but when that trial inevitably comes. Who knows, it could be this next week you receive a phone call. Two weeks down the road you receive a phone call. What trial that you might be going through on that day. And if I'm really honest with you, it's not even day, uh, one day, but it's days of trials, of circumstances in this life. 
This is not the prosperity gospel this morning, is it? (laughs) There will be days of trials in our life. When you think about it, when you overcome one trial, it's not like all of a sudden that you're not going to experience another trial ever again in your life. It's not that way at all. That it's not like all of a sudden you went through something and all now you are just skipping through a field with Jesus full of joy and everything is great, full of daisies. And man, Jesus is my friend and Jesus is with me. Everything's going to be fantastic and good. It's not that way at all, is it, church? But count it all joy when you go through trials. Trials of various kinds. Sadly, people pass away. Sadly, there's difficulty in marriage relationships. Sadly, we encounter financial difficulty. Sadly, in this life, there are some difficult things in relationships and circumstances that we will have to walk through. And James is telling his persecuted church in the middle of all these trials, I don't know what you've gone through. I don't know what you're walking through right now. But he's saying, count it all joy when you go through trials. Now look at this next verse in verse 3. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. This term, testing, it is used by a silversmith back in biblical times. And what they would do is they would put all the silver in a pot and they would turn the fire up and the heat on and what would happen to that silver is all the impurities, all the flaws, it would rise to the surface and then the silversmith would come across the top and he would scoop the impurities off the top known as the dross and he would do this over and over and over again and he would turn the heat up even more and keep on turning it up until all the impurities came to the surface. And he knew that the silver was purified and the silver was good when he could see his reflection in the silver. What happens in his life is we will walk through trials and what the Lord is allowing those trials to do is he's allowing all the impurities and all the gunk and all the stuff that is in our heart because we live in a fallen world to come to the surface and sometimes in those trials you recognize, man, Lord, what is that inside of my heart that I'm feeling? What is that impurity, Lord? Would you, would you take it like the silversmith and would you scoop those impurities off the top? Would you take it, Lord, as you're revealing these things and then he makes you more into the reflection of Jesus. Do you see that process? He's not as interested in your comfortability as he is interested in you becoming a reflection of him. And the only way you become a reflection of Jesus is if, you, if, you, if you're tried as Jesus was tried. If you go through the things in which Jesus went through. I mean, Jesus, he encountered some trials in his life. He was crucified, a gruesome death on the cross. He was betrayed, sped upon, all of these things. People doubted him. His friends doubted him. His family doubted him. He was persecuted by the Roman church, by the Romans. Count it all joy, though, when you go through trials. How in the world is it possible as this testing and all these impurities that rise to the surface when we go through trials that the Lord is bringing out and he's like the silversmith scooping it off the top. How in the world do we find joy in the middle of this? How in the world? I want to give you two things this morning and how to find joy in the middle of a trial. We can have joy in trials when we realize trials are a path to maturity. We can have joy in the middle of trials when we realize that trials, they're a path to maturity. Verses 3 through 4, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect. In other words, you're reaching to a point of maturity. Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, If you just take this conversation and let's just think about maturity in the context of naturally and not spiritually. Have you not grown physically and intellectually through making mistakes in your life? It's through falling, it's through scraping your knees, it's through going 
through some stuff and thinking that you're right only to learn that you were wrong all alone. That is how you have grown naturally in your life. If that's natural, why do we think it's any different on a spiritual context? That how do we grow spiritually? We grow by messing up. We grow by falling. We grow by thinking we're right only to discover, man, Lord, I was way off and I am wrong. That is how we grow spiritually in maturity. There's no difference between natural and spiritual. I mean, all of us in this room, we would love to think, okay, when we're saved, all of a sudden, man, we're wise, we've got it worked out, we've got it together. Man, I am now mature Christian because, man, I'm opening the word of God and I'm reading it and I don't have to go through any storms, I don't have to go through any trials, I'm just going to naturally reach maturity by just, man, spending time with him. And yet we need to lean in and spend time with God because trials will come. And in the middle of the trial, what God does is he helps us walk through those trials. And then we can find joy in the trial because we know that God is with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He's with us through every storm, every battle we are facing, and he will give us victory. But he's more interested in you growing into maturity than you are being comfortable in your life. We grow when we mature spiritually, through falling, through messing up, through difficult circumstances in our life. So how do we grow uh, uh, in maturity? Through difficult circumstances. And so we can count it all joy when we realize, man, in the middle of everything that's happening and going on, I know that the Lord is doing something. He's maturing me to become more like him. How many of you want to be more like Jesus? He's maturing you through every trial, through every storm, through every circumstance that you may not understand to become more like Christ. I mean, for those of you who have gone through the dark night of your soul and you've come out on the other end where, man, that trial was hard and I went all the way to the brink of just giving up. When you've been through a trial like that before and you come out on the other side, a year, two years later, you realize, man, Lord, I'm really thankful for that circumstance now because I've learned something in the middle of that. I've grown from that. I've discovered some things about myself through the middle of this trial. And so now I can look back and I can be thankful for it. But man, while you're in the middle of it, It can be hard, it can be testing, but if you have the perspective of Christ, if you have the perspective that Jesus is maturing me through this, it's a step to counting it all joy when you go through trials. So we can have joy in trials when we realize that the trial is a path to maturity. The second thing, we can have joy in trials when we realize that trials help us be aware of our need for God. It helps us be aware of our absolute need For God, how many of you just need Jesus? We absolutely need Jesus. Like we are nothing without the Lord. Look at verse five here. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. Trials help us be consciously aware of our need for God. Because every single one of us in this room, we have a deceptive heart. I mean, just think about this for a moment. Every single one of us, we think that when things are going really, really well, really, really good, somehow we think that we did that. Let's just be honest with ourselves. We may not even be able to recognize it and see it. That's the deceptiveness of our wicked heart. We think that, man, when things are good, when there's no trials, when there's no storms, somehow I'm the greatness that made today. That's the deceptiveness of our wicked heart. But man, When we're going through a trial and what we do is we come to the Lord and we're clinging, we're holding on to him saying, Lord, I've got to have you. Lord, I need you so desperately in the middle of this. Lord, I know that you are maturing me. Lord, I know that I need you through this. When we're going through that, what does it cause us to do? It causes us to be people who go to him and pray. It causes us to lean into the Lord. It causes us to cling on and not let go of Jesus. Lord, I've got to have you and there's no part of me, God, that... I need in of myself, I just need you. 
Lord, would you decrease inside of me so that you may, uh, Lord, would you, may I decrease inside of myself so that you may increase, right? Lord, I need you to take control. I've got to have you, Lord. I need you desperately. This is our deceptive hearts. And oftentimes what ends up happening when we're going through a trial is we come to a place where like, Lord, I don't know why I'm going through this. When everything's great, you're like, man, it was me. When everything's hard, God, I don't know why I'm going through this. And we come to a place oftentimes where we're battling with this and even anger rises up against the Lord. But then you realize, Lord, I know that you've got me through, you're taking me through this so that you're maturing me and you're allowing me to see my incredible need for you. Let's read up to this point, verse 2, verse through verse 5. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you, meet various, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously. You can ask God for wisdom in the middle of your trial, in the middle of your circumstance, in the middle of, man, Lord, I don't know why this is happening. I do not understand Lord, would you give me wisdom, God, to understand? Would you give me wisdom in navigating this situation? Lord, I'm crying out, God, give me wisdom. Give me the ability, God, to see things clearly that I would not turn to the left or to the right. But, Lord, give me wisdom to keep your, my eyes focused on you and you alone. So what happens is this trial, it comes and the rain pours, and the storm comes. And what this storm produces, it produces this fight inside of us. It produces a steadfastness to keep going. It produces this thing inside of us of recognizing and realizing, man, it is only God that's going to carry me through, and so I can have this fight. I can have only through the power of the Spirit of God that lives within me. Am I going to be able to get through this? And so the trial comes. You have this resolve. You have this strength that only comes from the Lord. And then what he's doing is he is maturing you through the testing. He's, he's allowing you to recognize that only need God and him alone. And this process begins to happen. And then you come to this place and you realize and understand that, man, if I've got Jesus and I've lost everything, I've got everything. But man, you come to this place and you realize if I don't have Jesus and I've lost everything, then I've, or I've got everything, I don't have anything at all. that Jesus is the only thing that really matters. If I've got Jesus, I've got everything that I need. If I, if, I, uh, if I don't have Jesus and I gain everything in this world, I don't really have anything at all. Is God allowing you to come to that place? It's a really a beautiful experience as you get to that place. I've just got to have Jesus. I've just got to know him. I've just got to lean into him. He's the author, the perfecter of my faith. He's the one that I love, and his love is unending. And he is chasing after me, and he is helping me through every storm and circumstance. And you realize all of that, man, the beauty of that. Look at verse 6. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. It seems a bit harsh, doesn't it? It seems a bit harsh to say. A double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. God says, if you're confused by the trial, though, ask me in faith without doubt. Because if you do ask without doubt, with doubt, then you're a double-minded man. But my, I just kind of pose this question, though. Why would you be asking, though, if there was no doubt? You know what I mean? There's this tension there. Like, where is the line of faith and where is the doubt? God, I believe, but man, Lord, I'm struggling to believe. Where is that line? And when asking and posing this question, my mind immediately goes to Mark chapter 9. And you see the story of a father bringing his son to Jesus. 
and his son, he is demonized and he is foaming at the mouth. He's rolling around on the floor and he is manifesting. And Jesus, he says this. He asks this question. So he, he being Jesus, asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. Verse 22, and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if, everybody say if. Yeah. Come on, say if. You'll wake out there. Yeah. If you can believe. Look what Jesus says. All things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Now, is there anyone in this room right now who can just say amen to that? You've been there before. You've been like, man, God, I believe that you're the son of God. I believe you're with me. I believe that you're for me. Lord, I believe you've got this circumstance. You've got this trial. But, Lord, there's a part of me that doesn't believe. Lord, I believe. But, God, would you help this unbelief that is rising inside of my heart? Lord, help me. And so posing the question, where is the line of faith and doubt? Where's the line of praying this legal prayer? And I love that God makes it legal that, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Where is that line between faith and doubt? Let's keep reading. Verse 25, when Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Here is the good news, church. Here's the good news. As we find this line of, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief, Jesus says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can move mountains. In other words, man, just that little ounce of faith that's within you, he can work and he can move on your behalf. And all it takes is being honest with the Lord. Lord, I believe right now, but God, I don't understand the circumstance. I don't understand this trial. I don't understand why I'm going through the storm. But Lord, would you help my unbelief, God, like I've got to have you. I need you, Lord, right now in this circumstance. Well, I believe, but help my unbelief. What happens is, what does Jesus do? He heals this demon-possessed boy. He comes in and he will answer you. He will be with you. And here's the thing about this, though. Is he may not answer the way that you want. Oftentimes, we want God to move in a certain way. And we're believing for it. But there's something else. But our job, though, is to pray with great faith, knowing that God can move, knowing that God's going to do it. And then we trust God with the rest. We trust God through the trial. But what the trial does, it brings us to a place of praying and believing and contending with great faith, knowing that we don't fight for victory, we fight from a place of victory. And I know what the end of the book says. It means, it, the end of the book says that we have victory for those who are in Christ Jesus. Like the tomb was rolled away and we have victory through Jesus and him alone. Not through our own might, not through our own power, but by his strength. Him that lives within us. What Christ is returning for is he's returning for a mature bride. He's not returning for a bride that is not mature. And so he's going to allow testing in our life, trials in our life, because he's coming back not for a little girl, but for a mature bride one day. And in that day when he comes back for the mature bride, there will be no more testing. There will be no more pain, no more hurt. There would be a life in the presence of Jesus. 
But while we were here on this earth and we were going through trials and situations and difficulties, and trial situations we didn't even deserve, you might say, man, it's not fair. Life isn't always fair. But Jesus is with you. And he can give you strength through it. But as we're going through this trial, the Lord, he pours out his love, his grace, his goodness, his faithfulness upon you. Look what it says here in Romans chapter 5, verse 3. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. How is it possible? How is this possible? We also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because what? The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I love that. The Lord is pouring out upon his people his love. But we can experience the, de the depth of his love through every single trial, circumstance, situation, to really understand the height, the width, the depth, the length, the breadth of the love of God that he pours out liberally over his people. So through that, the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. I want to close with this, Philippians 3. But what things were gained to me? These I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I've suffered the loss of all things, but I count it all things loss for the excellence, though, of knowing Christ. He writes, I've suffered all things. I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through Faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. I love this next part. That I may know him. I've suffered all things lost that I may know him. That I might not just know intellectually, but I might actually really have this relationship with God and know him from the depth of my heart that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings. I love verse 10 there. I just want to read it again. Like, just really listen to every single word that's written right here. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection, his resurrected power that can carry you through any storm, any trial, any situation. He's a God who heals today. He's a God who delivers. He's a God who brings freedom that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings. How many of you want to know the fellowship of his sufferings? I don't really want to on the surface, but I know that in that God is maturing me and I'm recognizing my incredible need for Jesus. You see, Jesus, he knew what it was like to suffer. You know the thing that Jesus felt more than anything else when he's on the cross? The pain that he felt more than anything was when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew in that moment what it was like to be separated from God. Our goal in life is to give thanks through all circumstances. It says in the word of God, this is God's will for you, to give thanks in all circumstances. Because in that, you're going to know the Lord. This isn't a popular message. <laughs> this isn't one that normally people would want to preach. But what I know is that in this Christian life, there are trials. But we've got to be able to navigate the trials. And recognizing through that, God is bringing us maturity. 
and this incredible need for the Lord. Should you do me a favor, would you rise with me? I want to pray for you.